Hey, welcome back to another episode of the Dig Deep, the Mining Podcast. And today's guest is Gallian Mac- McNamara, who's the CEO of so- Suma Silver Corp, who are TX- TSX listed explorer, focusing on developing the huge property in the prolific Tonopah district of Nevada. Um, Gallian is a geologist by trade uh, and has over 15 years experience in discovering capital markets. Um, and apart from heading up Suma Silver, uh, he also sits in a number of different balls, which I'm sure uh, he will tell us about. So um, he's here to tell us more about Suma Silver um, and about the current silver market. So that's welcome, uh, Gallen, to the podcast. How are you doing, Gallen? I'm I'm doing very well, Rob, and thanks for having me on, and thanks for that uh, very uh, nice introduction. No, appreciate your time as well. So just wondering if you can um, tell the audience a little bit about your about yourself, about your background and uh, your career. Sure, sure. So yeah, like like you were saying, I'm a geologist going back about 15 or a little over 15 years now. Uh, I'm originally from Canada and, and went to school here in, in Canada in, in a place called uh, Sudbury, Ontario. Uh, and from there, I've, I've more or less worked in most places in Canada, a little bit in South America, and now a little bit in the southwestern U.S. Uh, my focus has really always been on uh, gold, precious metal, you know, gold and silver uh, base metals, and then and with a with a four year, I'd say sojourn into uranium, where um, you know we ended up making some very large discoveries in the Athabasca Basin. Um, the best one being the Arrow deposit, which of course is uh, is a very very high profile uh, uranium deposit that's currently being developed. Okay, um, I wonder if you can tell us uh, just a snapshot of um, Suma Silver. Yeah, so Suma Silver is a, it's a very, very brand new silver focused exploration company with two properties in the southwestern US. You know, I always like the southwestern US and I really always like these historic, really prolifically prolific, real past historic producers that hadn't really seen any modern exploration. So we've got two properties that have that type of flavor to them. The first one is in uh, central Nevada. It's about halfway between Las Vegas and Reno, right on the highway, called the Tonopah District. So we have the eastern half of the Tonopah District. And, and before we started drilling, really, in 2020, um, there hadn't been any modern exploration on this property at all. Uh, so what we found in 2020, when, when we you know, came back and gave it a first pass uh, of, of drill holes, was, Hold up with this year as we really try to push towards thinking about resource in about a year from now. So that's the one project. The second project is in New Mexico, southwestern New Mexico, and it's called the Mugion project. So this one again, it's a very similar flavor to uh, to Tonopah, and then it's this historic past producer. I think it was the the largest historic silver producer in New Mexico. Uh, production shut down there at the start of World War II because that's when all silver and gold mining in the U.S. stopped by law. When the U.S. went into World War II, uh, and then really since then, you know, there's been a few drill holes here and here and there that have had some success, but no real systematic approach to the whole thing. And that's what we're starting with now. Uh, so we're drilling there now as well. Okay. And um, before going to obviously talk about some of the projects, uh, I just sure. want to give us a, an overview of the the silver market um, sort of presently at the moment. Yeah, well, I, I, it's it's good timing that we're talking now, and, and there's been a lot of people like myself, you know, that have been droning on endlessly about, you know, why silver is really, really the trade to be in in the next little while, you know, the next several years, I think, because, you know, number one, you've got this inflationary pressure, and you just look at those numbers from yesterday, uh, when we're talking on November 11th, with the 6.2 CPI print in the US, I mean, that's, uh, that's crazy, and, and that's probably understated. You know, when comparing to what they're saying is going on to what, with what's really going on, um, you know, it's probably vastly understated. So, you know, it, it, it's really becoming obvious now that they're not able to keep um, to keep this under control. And I think it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. So, you know, things like silver and gold are, are good metals to be in from that perspective, just as a hedge against inflation. But the other thing that, you know, people like me like to point out is that, hey, you know, like I'm I'm heavily involved in both silver and gold, but historically in precious metals bull markets, silver outperforms gold. And, and, you, and you go, why, you know, why, why is that? Well, you know, a, a lot of silver production, some, somewhere between 60 and 70% is, 
used uh, for industrial purposes. You know, so so pick whatever because it's such a great conductor. You know, number one, it's got a lot of other great you know uses for you know industrial purposes. But what's really happening now is that silver has also become an ESG metal. So something like you know certainly tens of millions of ounces a year, or maybe up to hundred million ounces a year, are used in solar panels. Uh, millions and millions of ounces a year are, are used in electric cars. And as we continue to build out both those industries, and if you think about it, you know, and and if and if we think that we're going to transition to you know, 100% electric car production, say in 20 or 30 years or whatever it is, or sooner, who knows, um, the demand for silver in a situation like that is going to, you know, almost double what it is today. And instead of using a billion ounces of silver a year, or instead of producing a billion ounces of silver a year, you know, we're going to need to use and produce, you know, double that or triple that. So the, the demand picture um, industrial for silver is, I think, going to get pretty, pretty crazy. And then when you couple that against a uh, you know, infinite QE and infinite money printing and this inflation thing that's going on, you know, it's almost like a perfect storm. Yeah. Um, is, there en is there enough silver discoveries being made or are we really far behind the eight ball on this? Well, you know, that's a, that's an interesting question. I tell you, you know, I was looking for a silver project for a long time, you know, and, and if you look at, you know, all the silver companies out there, there's like four majors, right? Like silver, good silver assets are really hard to find just as a geologist. You know, number one. So that tells you a lot right there. Good silver, silver assets, to, you know, in the in a place like the U.S., like in a place like Nevada, are almost impossible to find. So you know, in in terms of in terms of that question, are we finding enough silver? Well, I mean, so far the answer is probably no. If we need to, if we need to kind of service a demand that's going to be double what it is today, well, then it's the answer is heck no. You know, so that really means there's only one thing that can happen to, you know, the silver price, and that's well, hopefully, theoretically, it, it goes up. Um, and that's not even really getting into all of that, you know, market manipulation, theoretical stuff that a lot of other people talk about. Yeah. Um, your property uh, in Tonopah has released two sets of drill results this year. Um, how many meters have been sort of drilled to date? Um, and how many more meters do you expect to be drilled for the remainder of the year? So we're at, so, well, let's start at the beginning. So in 2020, we drilled about 15,000 meters and change. This year we'll be at about 12. Uh, we're just literally, as we speak right now, about halfway through our last hole there, um, where we drilled uh, 31, 30 holes last year and then another 20 holes this year, really. But again, it's just, just trying to get our hands around you know, how much silver could be left. And what we're finding in Tonopah is that you know, over a strike length of three and a half kilometers, and we've drilled multiple zones now just based on our geologic targeting, that we're getting grades in excess of a thousand grams per ton over that strike length on multiple targets. So, you know, this year again has been an idea of what do we have on our hands while at the same time, you know, systematically stepping out around where we know there's high grade. And, you know, when I say something like high grade, you know, our best hole is 4,408 grams per ton silver equivalent over 2.8 meters. Uh, and within that though, there's a, a 0.9 meter you know, high grade interval of, of almost, you know, over 11,000 grams per ton silver equivalent. So, um the grades in that district it, i mean it's it's very very just to me as a geo it's it's shocking it's very high yeah um now that you're uh, sort of drilling commenced that uh Morgion, and it, you obviously continue to uh drill at uh, tonopar um what can you expect in terms of sort of timelines and and news releases between now and the end of the year and well, going into next year yeah, I'd say, you know, like, yeah, even thinking into next year, we're still drilling now pretty aggressively and it's mid-November, right? So I'd say, you know, as results come back and they're starting to come back, especially for the Tonopah project in Nevada, um, as results come back, you know, we'll, we'll batch them out as they come back. Um, you know, we've, we've seen them, as I was saying, we've seen them start to come back, but then, but then we're really just getting started in New Mexico. So in New Mexico, um, you know, I would expect those results to, to be trickled out throughout 2022 because we need to drill a minimum of 15,000 meters there um, between now and say the middle of next year. Okay. Um, given how much strike uh, there is, is to cover at uh, Mogion, uh, what is your approach to finding uh, drill targets? Yeah, yeah. So that's, you know, given, given how much strike to cover, let me qualify that a little bit. So what we're drilling now, we're drilling a target that has a strike length of about 500, maybe 600 meters. In total, there's 34 kilometers of strike length of vein and structure that's all highly perspective on the property. 
So we're drilling something like between one and 2% of that right now. Now, you know what? Okay. It, it's not all blue sky. Some of it has been mined by the old time miners, but, but it's, it's a very, very minority, small minority of that, that we think has actually been tested properly and, and been mined. Uh, so, so in, in terms of approach to where do we start, right? So we do know from some work that was done in the eighties that, Hey, you know, there is still some good mineralization around some of these old mines, you know, some very good mineralization around some of these old mines. So we're starting where we have just a little bit of information from the past, uh, that we can follow up on and, you know, Hey, we don't need to try to reinvent the wheel on the first holes we drill. Let's just start where we know there's mineralization. So we can just start confidently building out from there. Yeah. And how comes nothing has sort of happened over that period of time from back then to yeah. sort of now? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Well, let's go back to the end of uh, the end of World War Two, you know, when the war stopped, um, you know, things didn't really get going back in there. And then a lot of times in these old mining districts, especially in the US, there's there's land, land fragmentation issues where, you know, one person owns this area, another person's maybe grandfather owned that area or something like that. And it takes a lot of work to put it all back together. Um, so that was actually done in the 1970s and 80s uh, by a geologist and his name was John Livermore. And John's a really famous geologist and it was a very famous geologist in Nevada. He was the guy that found the original Carlin style deposits for Newmont back in the 60s. So he really liked this area, um, put it all back together in the 70s and then uh, in the eighties drilled it. And I mean, when, he, when I say he drilled it, he paid for the drilling, like out of his oh. pocket, he paid for the drilling. Yeah. Uh, and he's the guy that really, and, and his team and his partner, Andy Wallace are the guys that, that really got uh, some very interesting results back in the eighties, you know, but of course you're dealing with, you know, metals markets that go up and down and really a different capital market in the U S than we have here in Canada. Um, and, and the fact that, Hey, you know, like a, a guy can only drill so many holes out of his pocket, right? It's expensive, you know? So, it, you know, nothing really happened then. And, 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 you know, bringing us to how we got it. Well, John's partner, uh, Andy, uh, he is a director of a company called Allegiant Gold and they ended up having it as their seventh project or something. Uh, Allegiant's really concentrating on some really interesting, uh, open pit style, uh, gold mineralization in Nevada that's you know probably multi-million ounce potential you know so they're very busy with that so a high grade silver district in New Mexico doesn't really fit their corporate focus uh, but of course it fits ours perfectly so uh, in at the end of the summer in 2020 in the summer last year we did a deal to option it off of them and have since have just been uh, putting everything back together in terms of 3D targeting um, doing the legwork on the ground um, you know getting the drill permits so we can actually set ourselves up for um, what's going to be a very, very significant amount of drilling over the coming, I think, several years. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's a certainly a good story. Um, yeah. What can we expect during uh, 2022 in terms of uh, sort of the resource estimates? Yeah, you know, I think that we're really going to be pushing for resources <clears throat> on both of these projects uh, in, say, a year from now. Um, where I think now we've, we've, we've got a good understanding of what we think's left and, and where the areas that we can really drill to start systematically building out. And we're doing that on both projects now. Uh, now it's just a matter really of execution, you know, of, of going and doing the work and, and looking at the results, which so far have been very, very strong. Uh, and then in a year from now, um, you know, with the goal is to publish two resources on both these projects that, to be honest with you, as soon as we put them out, they'll probably be out of date because, you know, we're not going to stop drilling. We'll, we'll just keep stepping out after, you know, whatever a cutoff date is for a resource estimate. Um, how is your cash on hand, um, given your current burn rate and drilling at two separate properties? Um, yeah. Are you sort of well financed headed into 2022? Yeah, we are. So we've got $6 million in the bank right now. Um, so quite well financed. Uh, I would say well enough financed to be opportunistic. I mean, we're all... Um, you know, all, all of us exploration companies are, are based on a model that requires further financing for more drilling. So we're not any different than that. But we're at the point right now where we're, we're not seeing any pressure to finance. You know, we can just keep our heads down and, and plug away and, and just watch the market conditions as they continue to evolve. Yeah. Um, given the price of uh, silver today, which offhand, I can't remember exactly what the price is. Um, does it make exploration more feasible? 
Um, and what do you think the outlook for the silver market is for 2022? Um, and do you yeah. sort of believe the junior silver exploration companies are sort of undervalued at the moment? Yeah, that's a, there's a lot to unpack in that question. But yeah. let's, let's get into it for sure. So, yeah, I think we're sitting at about $25 an ounce for silver. Uh, of course, in the COVID crash, I think it got down to 12 or 13, right? Which, which you know, made that was just people running to liquidity. Okay, fine. Um, so I think, you know, in terms of where do we see the silver price going? Well, let's look at the gold to silver ratio today. And I think it's between 75 and 80 or yeah. something like that. Right. Well, I mean, if you look historically, the so the gold the, the the price ratio, the gold and silver price ratio is usually somewhere between fifteen to one. If you go back through time, okay. So, you know, you could do the math there, and it can you know wow wow you know that could be a big difference, right? But I, I really think that more importantly, look at gold to silver in the ground and the Earth's crust, or gold to silver produced, it's something like seven to one, right? So I mean that right there. If if we really want to see price discovery in silver, I mean we can look to those ratios and, and just say, Hey, you know, look at what, you know, look at what is happening in reality versus what is happening in the markets. And okay. You want to say manipulation, this, that, the other thing, fine. You know, those are interesting arguments that I've thought about a lot. And I'm sure a lot of people think about a lot, but let's just keep it simple and look at those ratios and say to ourselves, well, what's going on here. Yeah. And um, what, what about sort of junior miner, junior sort of silver miners? Do you think they're sort of undervalued at the moment? Yeah, I think uh, many of them are because uh, number one, like I was saying before, good silver projects are really hard to find and there's not really that many in, su in silver juniors. Um, so that's number one. Number two, I would say, you know, once the, once the larger investors in, in this inflation driven, you know, beginning, uh, beginnings of a precious metal bull market, once the generalist style investors start getting into the majors, you know, it's, it's an age old story, you know, that you start with the majors, you go to the mid tiers, and then from there, the juniors, you know, get picked up. And because um, there's, there's a lot of, let's just say, there's a lot of volatility in a lot of these juniors. A lot of times they really outperform uh, because it doesn't take as much money coming in to really make a lot of these companies run. Yeah. Um, is there a sort of late stage silver exploration company that you sort of hope to follow? In, uh, in their footsteps? Well, you know, and I think there's a, there's, a, there's a couple of good examples and, you know, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel here by any means. But, you know, I look at a company like, like Silvercrest or I look at a company like Bizla who, you know, went into these historic districts in um, Mexico where there was a lot of historic past production. You know, I think both of them saw, I know, I know in Las Chispas at Silvercrest, there was something like 100 million ounces of past production, which, you know, taken just on its, on, uh, you know, taking just at face value, you think to yourself, well, it all must be gone. Well, you know, it turns out it's not, right? And that these, these areas can host hundreds and hundreds of millions of ounces. Um, so, you know, you take a company like a Silvercrest in 2016, who went into Las Chispas and, and really did a lot of good work and executed, executed, executed. Uh, their market cap when they got started was somewhere between, I don't know, 10, 20, 30 million dollars, depending on the time. You know, fast forward to today, five, six years late, later, it's like a $1.3, $1.5 billion market cap, depending on the week. So those are the types of things that, you know, it, that's the type of shot we're taking here. It's the type of swing that, you know, I want to take if I'm going to spend years of my life really devoted to this, you know, to this venture. Yeah. Um, and as a sort of conclusion, is there anything else that you want to add and maybe what, what you see the outlook uh, for, for sort, of, sort of sumer silver over the next 18 months, two years? Yeah, so I, you're pressuring me to, to, to give, <laughs> give you a number. <laughs> and that's, no, that's I, great. I'm, I'm, no, I'm not pressuring <laughs> to give any, any numbers. It's entirely up to you. But I suppose as a conclusion, um, is there anything else that you want to add? And yeah, I suppose the outlook of, of the company and where do you expect to be, say, in two years? Yeah, well, you know what? We're right now we're really focused on building ounces and really focused on drilling with with the the say the medium term next steps of of really putting out resources so we can start quantifying to the markets what we actually have, what we think we have now. You know, but that'll just be a step one. You know, me personally having been through this process and different companies and, and different discoveries before, uh, you usually find that that step one uh, you know grossly underestimates what's actually there. 
So you probably do that. You know, you probably have to keep that going a little bit, but you get to a point of, you know, I'll call it inflection where, you know, you, you start thinking about what the actual next steps are and, and you start thinking about, you know, feasibility and eventually production. So within the next couple of years, we'll definitely be focused more on that than, than we are now. And, and right now it's just pure d discovery excitement, which is a great place to be in. But, uh, you know, that, that for me, you know, I'm, we're always thinking about the next steps. Yeah, I understand. Gallen, really appreciate your time in, uh, in uh, giving us an overview of uh, Sumer Silver. Um, it's certainly a, an exciting uh, adventure that you're, that you're starting out on. Obviously, like you said, Silver Discoveries are s sort of few and far between. So um, sort of wish you all the success in the future. Um, if our audience wants to reach out to you, if they've got any questions, um, how can they go about doing that? Are you on any social media? I, I am personally on social media at, at Galen McNamara on Twitter. And then you can find me on LinkedIn, LinkedIn as well. And then uh, the company Suma Silver also is on Twitter and on LinkedIn. And, and I think it's at Suma Silver on both of those. Okay. We'll, we'll include those in the show notes accompanying this Great. anyway. So um, like I said, really appreciate your time. I um, hope the audience enjoyed that episode and sort of understanding Silver and, and obviously what an important um, precious metal it is, obviously alongside gold. Um, and he's probably undervalued in the marketplace as well and hard to discover. So appreciate if you can share this episode amongst people that you know in the industry and also friends and family. Um, and maybe some, that, some people that don't actually understand the precious metals market. Um, it certainly can be an eye, eye opener for them as well. So appreciate you um, if you can share this episode amongst those people. And yeah, and also appreciate your continued support. So until next time, happy mining.